Hello, welcome to the Flute 360 podcast, where we incorporate a panoramic view of flute-related topics. I am your host, Heidi K. Begay, and this is Episode 9, an interview with Carol Winsense. Please note that this interview was recorded in September of 2017 during Carol's residency at the Texas Tech University's School of Music. Today I'm with Carol Winsense, who of course needs no introduction, while she's here at Texas Tech University during her residency. The last few days, she's been not only coaching woodwind quintet performances, but flute masterclasses and private lessons. So it's been a very busy week for you. So I appreciate you taking the time. Oh, it's my pleasure, Heidi. Very kind. You have a very vast career. Not only are you an international performer, but you're a teacher. Throughout your career, was there one piece of advice, whether from a colleague, a friend, that really impacted you? Oh, that's multi-layered, of course. I think the grand influence of growing up with professional classical musicians Mm. already set the stage, so to speak. And it was almost a given because I showed uh, that talent and Mm. affinity. And because my mother primarily also had me seriously classically dancing, classical Mm. ballet. My teacher was from New York City Ballet. And They put me in a drama group ever since I was nine. Mm. So I was doing very sophisticated roles as a nine-year-old, but mostly the theater exercises that go along with it, which is why Mm. what you saw in those classes, communication, anticipating another person's move or Mm. mood. I learned to love the arts, so I think the advice that I can give is that if you have a yearning to be an artist, Mm -hmm. so to speak, pursue that dream, that wish with absolute full force, complete abandon and trust Mm. to trust something within you. Now that comes through the development of, of gains and losses and responsibilities of taking the study very thoroughly and very deeply, which I had the opportunity to do. Mm -hmm. You know, I think all those dimensions of the theater, the dance, and then the actual music. I always tell my students I was born into an orchestra. Mm -hmm. My mother was quite large with me in her belly. She gave birth to me, a nearly nine-pound baby, and was probably at the rehearsal within (laughs) days Mm -hmm. because my father had three orchestras, three community orchestras. So I watched the blend of the very highest standards. My father was the first concert master of the Buffalo Philharmonic, and he became their associate conductor. And then he yearned to give back to the community. Oh. So I learned not only to pursue a dream of wanting to do this whole hog, but how to give back in the process. And I think now the challenge with the internet bringing such a wealth of information, awareness, that a young person probably thinks, well, where am I in this sea, this vast ocean of endless opportunities and possibilities, and where do I fit in? And I think there's always a niche that while you're pursuing this inner calling. It's a serious inner calling. I mean, Nadia Boulanger talks about it. Martha Graham talks about it. All the giants, they all talk about, Mm -hmm. if you're going to do this, you have to do it absolutely to the core and with all your force because you can't live without it. But then how can I give back? Mm -hmm. And there are endless ways of giving service in the music community and the classical music community, because we know These pieces have endured for a reason, and they can change your inner life. Mm. I mean, I know myself when I'm frantic and I'm on the highway, and all I have to do is push that button and have the classical station come on, and immediately I can breathe. You know, it. of course, I'm conditioned to appreciate very fine music and good performances of fine music, but still... 
it's fascinating how our primal selves come out of the womb. I mean, we mm -hmm. are primal. Everything depends on our survival. Mm -hmm. And, you know, receiving that as if you were receiving food, which was necessary for existence, you can receive the mood mm. of that and it'll help you and change you. So a young player, if they're an instrumentalist or a singer, mm -hmm. my son, for example, is a rock musician, yes. but he's joined with Sean Lennon. He just sent me a video there's an inner city, uh, New York City, Manhattan program called the Lennon Bus or something where mm. they're teaching a lot of John's songs, John Lennon's songs. This is Sean, his second son, who oh. was birthed from Yoko and John's union. And, you know, it always gives so much in return when you give out that way. Oh, neat. I really like how you mentioned, like, merging of the arts, you know, the theatrical side and visual ballet audio i mean it's all it's all linked it's all one yes you know? so that's really yes. beautiful that you make that connection so you've mentioned before that your father's violin playing has an influence on your flute sound specifically how so is it in the tone the articulation well all, all of, of the it? above yeah. all of it i think the sheer physics of the bow being drawn across a string to set mm. it into vibration, mm -hmm. there's friction there. Yes. You you are placing the bow on the string and you feel the friction yes. of the, the bow moving across the string and suddenly the string is in vibration. Okay. And also the violin is made of wood, mm. so that has resonating possibilities. Now you get the flute Mm -hmm. And it is by far not a resonator True. like wood is. And Arthur Weisberg's book, The Art of Wind Playing, mm -hmm. describes, he, he describes how we as wind players have to find a resonance mm -hmm. within the sound. So I loved that the string instruments were resonators to begin with. Mm -hmm. And because I had that at such a young age, I just copycatted. Mm -hmm. I just mimicked. Um, I put the flute to my lips. I was blessed with having a good sound right away. But that may have come from that core. Sure. I always talk about the core of the sound, that sort of bullseye center to the sound. Now, sure. our embouchure plays a huge role in this because it does create some friction by the sheer fact that only a certain percentage of air goes into the instrument, into the tube, to right. set it into vibration. So... We have to give it that extra mile mm. as a flute player specifically because we have no friction implement like a mouthpiece. A reed. I mean, a, something to blow completely 100% into like a brass mouthpiece or a reed mm. or something percussive like the piano or the harp. Mm. So we have to work extra hard. And I really believe that you can't be passive for one second to that force right to that uh, forward motion mm. that you have to create and there you go in terms of core mm -hmm. and bullseye mm -hmm. you have to have that as a dancer yes you have to know where your balance and your center is and we have to find our center all the time mm -hmm. now sonorities flute sonorities come in all shapes and sizes mm -hmm. and qualities and that's where being the grand musician comes into play mm. because I often take a poll at a master class and I say, how many of you feel that the most impactful thing of being a, a flutist is the quality of your sound or the quality of your musicianship and mm. a certain number of hands go up. And then I say, how many, for how many of you do you feel that a riveting musician is more important than the most alluring sound. And yeah. then those hands go up. Yeah. So you see, it's it's deeply personal. Mm. But I think great artistry is, you know, one is able to combine both. So you have that gorgeous quality of sound that has a real center to it. And you're the alluring musician who can change mm. a listener's, you know, yeah. moment in, in existence. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. It's very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. It is beautiful. It is a yeah. beautiful thing when all the pieces fall together. Mm -hmm. Like looking at a great painting. Yes. And you're stay you're in front of that painting and you're saying, Oh, 
there's mm-hmm. such a resonance. We all know after going to an art gallery, yes. after what we've beheld, we walk out changed, yes. you know. Mm-hmm. And there's something very active about that. You know, when you go to a gallery and you're observing, that that's an active process. There's an exchange. Yes. It's very interesting. There, there's that finished canvas, mm-hmm. and yet it's creating some kind of dialogue. impact and dialogue. Dialogue, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's really neat. So when you're on stage, your main mission, what I'm hearing is um, is to change you know, your listener in some way to impact them, to send a message? I mean, are you, are you thinking about changing that person's heart or? You know, I think I'm very blessed that way. People say after a concert, oh, wow, you know, Mm -hmm. we were so taken along with you as you were in that process. We didn't even realize you were playing the flute. Of course, for me, that's the the greatest compliment that I was maybe a channeler Mm -hmm. of what that composer created. Now, I don't improvise. I mean, I improvise in that I sort of read the situation and say, "Ooh, what does that need right Mm -hmm. at this moment? You know, like uh, reacting to the acoustic of the hall is a very important thing. But I don't consciously, every time I enter the stage, say, wow, I'm going to change somebody today, okay. tonight. You yeah. know, I, I find that if I am true to trying to honor what the composer's intent was, okay. that I, I am on a path now that will help me, mm-hmm. that will enable me to just go with the composer's intent. Mm-hmm. And that's a very interesting thing because, you know, we're always learning. I mean, talk about giving mm-hmm. out. You know, we get back from the genius of a, of a composer or, you know, the gesture of somebody creating something and then I can resonate with that and recreate it. But there's this, um, how do I say it, uh, vulnerability. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to be willing to say, I surrender myself, my ego into trying to figure out what this composer is really asking for. And and then it's my job Mm. to slip into that skin Mm. of that intent. And then it's, it's pretty much all systems go because then you really are selfless on the stage that way. I see. If you're just joining in with, you know, the composer's wish or trying to figure that out even, you mm-hmm. know. I mean, there's so many masterworks that have now been created because I asked these composers to write. Like, mm-hmm. let me just take, for example, you know, Christopher Rouse's Flute Concerto, yes. which will remain in the repertoire because it's just rivetingly yes. extraordinary, mm-hmm. you know, compositionally, the emotional impact of the piece, the, the craftsmanship, how he wrote for the orchestra and the flute, the dialogue of the flute and the orchestra, the, the stories behind the various movements of the piece. And I, I came to Chris because there's, certainly because he's a, a 21st century composer and this piece is from the 20th century, uh, there were many questions because some things appeared very abstract, you know, and mm. I would say, I mean, I pretty much would get what he was aiming for, but with asking questions and, and in terms of my interpreting it, I said, how do you want me to play that? How, how is that supposed to really be conceived and be brought to fruition? And he often would say, you sound magnificent. You're doing exactly what I want. So Mm. it was a little frustrating. But then there were other composers like Peter Shickley or, or, you know, some others who would say, no, no, this is exactly what I want, and you got to do it this way. Oh, I see. It's fascinating. Yeah. It's quite it's quite an incredible process to be able to work with a living composer. But anyway, sure. when I go out on stage, oh, I'm you know multitasking to the sure. nines. I do consciously want to project something. Yes. But I think that may also go back to the theater background because when you have when you're in dialogue on stage, you have to project the character. Yes. You have to be a channel for who that character is in the play. Mm-hmm. And that's really interesting because yeah. you have to surrender who you are, who you literally are, you kind of have and to become get, that character. You have to kind of get out of the way, get yourself out of the way. You got it. Yeah. That's Which so requires neat. a kind of surrender. You know? Yes. 
Yeah. With technique. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to kind of piggyback off of what you were talking about with working with a living composer, how much is your voice heard during the editing process? Very good. Very good question. And a very <laughs> vital one. We premiered, we did the world premiere of a new version of Joan Towers' work, Rising, which she had wrote for me, uh, which she wrote for me for my 40th anniversary, my Ruby anniversary, which was a three concert series in New York City in major halls. So she, in the process, changed so many things <laughs> all the time. Okay. So there's an example of somebody, but with complete collaboration with me, she would say, does that really work on the flute? I mean, you sound great on it, but you know, and I'd say, listen, we want this piece to have a life. Sure. So it's got to be playable. Mm, yes. It can't be so awkward that it's going to mar mm. the intent of what you want. Like if you want full blown energy right there, sure. let me suggest ABC. And she is so open to that. She mm. is just a dream to work with because yeah. she might be a little prickly and say, you know, I don't like it that way. <laughs> right. How about this? And yeah. I'd say, well, let's try this, yeah. you know, and then we would arrive mm. at something. So you get all kinds, oh, you get sure. all kinds of shapes. When yeah. Lucas Foss <laughs> wrote his Renaissance concerto for me, which is another keeper in the mm. repertoire. First of all, I never even got the final part mm. and score, mm. but weeks before the premiere with oh. the Buffalo Philharmonic. <laughs> oh no. And he had it all set. So okay. I was, uh, mm, you know, here we go because it was so close to the premiere date. Okay. But, you know, he's a real enfant terrible, and he <laughs> was so wonderful. He came rushing into the Pfister Hotel in Milwaukee, <laughs> and he said, I just finished this fugue. Here, quick, let's do it quick. You know, and he was playing at the keyboard. There wasn't even a piano reduction yet for this oh, thing, wow. you know. And it was thrilling, thrilling. And after the premiere, I'm the one that said, you know, this is sheer magnificence. I mean, this is just genius, because okay. he used... Renaissance and uh, early Baroque material mm. as the source of a lot of things. There's no really original flute music in any of it from the 17th century or 16th century. But then I said, mm. ah, brazenly, I said, you know what, Lucas? You know what I think would work right there is a cadenza. You don't have a cadenza. And did he write me a cadenza? I mean, that thing is barely playable. <laughs> so be careful what you ask for. Yeah, right. <laughs> Oh, those are really neat stories. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How fun. In addition to all of this talk about working with living composers and collaborating with them, say you're learning a new piece where you don't get to collaborate with the composer mm -hmm. and you're learning a mm -hmm. brand new score. How do you go about mm -hmm. learning the piece? Are you doing score study? Are you singing it? What's your process Okay, so some of that comes out of experience, but now I'm sure. remembering when I lived in Rome mm. in 1966-67, mm. and I was a very able flutist there at age 16 or 17 or whatever I was, and I got snapped in mm. by the, uh, you know, grabbed by the new music community, and of course, that was the end of the 60s, so everything was very avant-garde mm. and very experimental. Sure. I was given a piece that had no note, standard note notation. It had figures. Oh. It had graphics. Oh, and geez. I had to play that piece. Oh, wow. I was looking at graphics, oh, like wow. little bubbles and balls and squares, large, bold colors. And oh, cool. yeah, I know I still have that piece because it's a work of art. Oh, you know, neat. it's something you can frame because it was so gorgeous to look at. Oh, cool. But I had to interpret the shapes. Oh, neat. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. And I was given that. And where was the composer? So I could ask him nowhere. Yeah. You know, there was finally he arrived. Right. But yes, very often I was given things that I had no idea how it was supposed to be shaped or this or that. So I had to rely on whatever dynamic things were there. Mm. You know, multiphonics were just starting then. Okay. That's when you have to play more than one note, yes. two notes at the same time on yes. the flute, which really depends on, you know, your embouchure and how you, you know, manage, you know, sometimes you just have to base it on whatever experience and technique. Oh. You know, a lot of this has to do with technique. Sure. But now I've seen the very young ones. There's Face the Music yes. at the Special Music School, which is in residence at the Kaufman Cultural Center. Mm -hmm. And that's where Merkin Concert Hall is in New York. These kids are 12, 13, 14, 15 who are navigating 
through some of the most challenging new music that's wow. being presented presented to them. So you can see there's a language mm-hmm. now that has been established and it may, it, I'm sure it's coming from the improvisatory realm. Mm-hmm. You know, we have Claire Chase who, you know, created her ensemble mm-hmm. to be in the living moment mm-hmm. of what's going, you know, forth in terms of what's possible. And that's that's opening up something in the player, the new 21st century young emerging player, to have that willingness, a kind of surrender and vulnerability to really stretch the boundaries, Mm. you know, and be able to be flexible and fluid enough to try things. Sure. You know, back in the late 60s, it was all revolution, you know, and a lot of the music was very angry. Mm. And very powerful, and it used to smash and crash my embouchure. I remember it always was very hard to recover mm. from having to play those Subito Fortissimi me and slam Sforzandi and, mm. you know, low register stuff. And that's like, then I'd have to go play Schubert Variations. And it was like, oh, my God, how do you switch? But this, <laughs> sure. again, is all, this. these are all the tools oh, that a okay. young player is now embracing and has to accept learning how to do. No, that's great advice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Finally, one last question. What guidance would you give 20-year-old Carol? Oh, the 20-year-old Carol. (laughs) Woo! Wow, what a fantasy that is to imagine. In this day and age, you mean? In this very day and age? Sure. Yeah. 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 Mm. Again, instead of... uh, And this is based on... I gave a class at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Mm. And it was a real mixed audience. There were people from my generation there. You know, this is, you know, I was born very end of the 40s, beginning of the 50s, and the young ones. And um, I asked, I, I took a poll, and I said, how many of you feel that the Internet has been an absolute boon and a doorway to endless possibilities? Because we didn't have that. Mm. As a young 20-year-old, we did not have that. Right. But to me, it, it just seems like a, an endless, you know, an array of mountain peaks that, you know, are just waiting to be scaled and climbed. Mm. And a lot of heads nodded. But then one 20-year-old raised his hand. He said, you know what? I think the opposite. I think it's created more alienation, mm. more depression, more feeling of isolation and boy, that was a big wake-up call for me. Sure. And I I think because it exists and it's not going away, mm. the internet, there's there is a way, and this is coming full circle now when we began the interview, right. is how to be of service. And I really think mm-hmm. that that has opened up doorways, even in the most minuscule way, whether you have one student that you can share and give some knowledge of your experience to mm. that is an exchange that will you know that will last forever if mm. it's genuine and if it's coming from your heart and and so i think we've all got to learn you mm. know we created this monster or let's say the <laughs> the geniuses in the computer world created this yeah. and there's got to be a way that we got to find the balance sure i think it's all about balance mm. because you want to develop your inner life equally to your outer life and Mm. i think the danger is that there is so much outer 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 that people are not going on into the inner and yet there's i'm standing with the yoga master right here (laughs) you know there's there's a way there's so many pathways to nurture the inner and Mm. it is there and it is available Mm. so i that's advice that i would give is that really attend to your inner and feed that inner and nurture that inner. And that's probably why the flute has, you know, stayed with me so potently because even my astrology, my astrology Mm -hmm. for the day I was born, June 29, says anything pertaining to the breath Mm -hmm. is what I'm all about. And it's like, whoa, you know, and I didn't realize as I was in my mid thirties, I was like the breath. That's everything. That's how you give life to, you know, that tube, that cold metal tube (laughs) or wood or what, you know, if we're playing traverso, but it is a tube. And so that breath and breath is also, you know, it's not ironic. It's the way you can come back to yourself. That's why I'm a big on breathing through my nose when I have time, Mm. you know, so. Well, thank you for your beautiful insights and advice and the time you've spent 
shared with us. Oh, my it means, pleasure. It means a lot to me. Oh, wonderful. Mm-hmm. And to me. Thank you, Heidi. Today's episode is sponsored by J&K Productions. They produce all of my episodes from adding the intro and outro music to editing the audio and all post-production needs. Contact them for your next podcast project at jkproductions.media. Thank you for listening to the Flute 360 podcast. For more information, please visit HeidiKBegay.com. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review in the iTunes store. Let's talk about flute.